Hey, are you a business owner, entrepreneur, or professional? If so, we want you to apply to be a featured guest on our show. My name is Adam Torres, and I host the Mission Matters series of podcasts. I've recorded over 3,000 episodes, and we are just getting started. How do you know if you'd be a good guest to be on the show? Well, only one way to find out, and that's to apply, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We want guests that have a story to tell, guests with a brand, a product, or a service that can benefit my audience of listeners. If this sounds like you, go to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. I'd love to talk to you and get to know more about your story. Again, head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, now let's get into the show. Welcome to another exciting show with our Mission Matters Club. Mission Matters is a media brand focused on the needs of entrepreneurs, business owners, executives. Every Thursday on Clubhouse, we put together a weekly show and we always change up the topic. So this week's topic is focused on seeing if the American dream still exists. I know we're going to have a dynamic conversation and all of our uh, speakers here are going to be introducing themselves in just a moment. But before they do that, you know, every Thursday, we do change up the topics. And to give you more context, we have published over 150 authors. And all of our, just our speakers here, are, majority of them are authors. And we always try to create these different groups with them on a weekly basis. We have recorded over 4,000 podcast episodes in the last several years, well, since we launched the company. And so we're always focused on generating a wide variety of content on many different topics. So any of our guests, if you're interested in joining our podcast, my email is directly in the link or in my profile. So feel free to follow me and any of the other speakers, definitely all the speakers here too, so that we can get you set up as a guest on the podcast. But beyond that, I know we have an exciting topic here. Adam is my counterpart and the host of our, all of the different podcasts that we oversee and uh, typically helps me moderate the rooms as well. So with that, Adam, I'm going to pass you the uh, baton here. And then why don't you coordinate intros and, or have everyone introduce themselves. And just with that, my name's Chirag and I'm done. Adam, feel free to take over. All right. Thank you, Chirag. And thank you for putting together again this, uh, this great topic and uh, great panel as always. And uh, just letting everybody know that's in the audience. So we normally start out with uh, with people that are on the panel, but we're definitely a friendly group and feel free to we, we take questions, all that good stuff and try to have a lot of fun. Just keep a really good dialogue going. So I guess just to get us started, maybe we start with Elizabeth, if you want to maybe introduce yourself and I'll start there. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Sharag. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. And uh, so, yeah, I'm Elizabeth. I am one of the blessed authors under the Mission Matters Publishing House with Sharag and Adam. So I am a Navy veteran. I also am an author due to these wonderful gentlemen. I'm an advocate a CASA for Orange County. I am also now a keynote speaker. I'm a board member and a moderator even here on the clubhouse. So really I wear a lot of different hats, but my military training and my professional experience has really propelled me three decades into six different industries. And so that's brought me all the way to founding my own company prior to the onset of the COVID crisis. And so I'm really working, focused on advocating for and supporting uh, women veterans and helping them get positions within the corporate space. So uh, many other things under my home, I think most endearing for me at this point is being a CASA for Orange County. And that's a court appointed special advocate where I actually am appointed by the Orange County Courts to advocate for children in the foster care system, children who have been abandoned, children who actually just have no representation and or abused and neglected. So really am uh, very happy and humbled to have joined on the Dot Helm as well this year. And so other details are in my bio, but thank you all so much for the floor. And I am Elizabeth Yo, and I yield the mic. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. My name is Kim Daly, and I am one of America's top franchise consultants. That was a beautiful introduction, by the way, Elizabeth. I'm over here going, oh, that's a really nice person. <laughs> that's a tough job you have. Elizabeth is the best. <laughs> That is a big hearty person right there. You're like my soul sister. So nice to meet you. So I am um, a franchise consultant, 19 years running my own business, helping entrepreneurs learn about franchising and follow their dreams and investors diversify their portfolio into franchise investments. I am also a published author. I have an international best-selling book called Franchising Freedom, 
and I'm so honored to be a part of this Mission Matters book as well. And I'm a mom. I have two awesome teenage sons, and we live here in southern New Hampshire. This year, I launched the best thing I've ever done professionally, my own YouTube channel. You can find me on KimDaily.tv. I am having a blast. My goal is to turn it into the first ever national franchise talk show host. <laughs> That's what I want to do now. I always dream big. Uh, but right now, we're uh, at yeah, Kim Daily TV. There's a lot of educational content, just a lot of information for people who are coming to the idea of wanting to own a franchise. Everything from, you know, the franchisee perspective to the franchisor perspective and all kinds of interviews, like a podcast-style interview with all different types of people from the industry. So definitely check it out and don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> That's my favorite two words this year, like and subscribe. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for having me on the, on the show tonight. <laughs> That's awesome, Kim, and thank you. And Catherine, I, I think you're there now. If you want, yeah. please, uh, Dr. Wilder. Um, and... My name is Dr. Catherine Wilder, and my background, I'm a performance consultant. I have my doctorate from the University of Virginia in kinesiology, and currently my newest project, I'll begin with that, is that with a colleague of mine, we've written a fiction novel which is really a self-help book for teens to be well do well and blah and i can i'm going to keep it simple i'm going to keep it right there but it's been a ton of fun kind of going out of the box going wide with this journey and adventure my purpose is and always has been to give back to pay it forward and i'm going to continue to do that i've got something new on the horizon that I can't yet announce. But one more thing to wrap up this year, it's been a very different, very challenging year for me on the personal front. Last August, actually right around this time, my husband found a small lump on my left breast. I went in and it was early stage breast cancer. Uh, but with today's treatments, they were very aggressive, and I'm actually still in chemotherapy treatments through the end of September. So I think in some ways, people are coming to me now and asking me to do interviews, and I don't. it's not on purpose, but I think in some ways I may be, by default, reinventing part of my personal brand. So we'll leave it at that. Wow, what an amazing story, Dr. Wild, and thank you for sharing. And I'm excited to get your take on the American Dream shortly, but I want, let's let Olivia please introduce yourself. So good to see you back here. If you want to do your intro and let us know a little bit more about yourself, please. Thank you. I really appreciate it. My name is Olivia Chavez Carroll. I, too, am a United States veteran. I have been, I was in the military for 22 years. I've been working in the military and veteran space now for 30 plus years. And I am the owner and founder of the Veteran Awareness Project. I am a best-selling author with the Behind the Rank series. I have been fortunate enough to write part of one of my chapters through them. So I was very excited when I got to meet Elizabeth. Uh, I produced my her first book when we met with The Mission Continues. And... It has been my passion to work with veterans as well as in the corporate space to share the the importance of employee engagement on, in the in the space of veterans and their family members and how that translates in the corporate sector. So many people, especially in the corporate world, don't understand how employee engagement and how that affects their bottom line until it until times like this COVID has really shown how it affects and still even now government and the government sector is starting to finally realize how it is affecting them and trillions of dollars later they're still trying to figure out why it is it is such a big issue so um that is me i am a, a combat aviator i have had a plethora of knowledge that i'm trying to put forth into and i have started to monetize that clubhouse has definitely been a new source of generating income as well as uh, allowing me to stay home and you know do the do the home and home and health 
process. I'm enjoying it. It is a new a new space for me, but I'm loving it. I, I'm in the process of working with Elizabeth on what my next adventure is with my new book and uh, where that's going. So I'm excited on how that will work with Mission Matters and, and my next steps. This is Olivia and I'm complete. All right. Thank you, Olivia. And so today's question, uh, I mean, I'm excited to get everybody's take on this. So does the American dream still exist? So I guess I'd really just, you know, open up the floor to maybe we need to, the American dream is just, that's such a broad topic. And it means so many different things to different people, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different genders, um, different gender identities. I mean, the American dream, I feel like has evolved and is always evolving. Maybe we start with just playing with the idea of like defining what some of those components mean. And I open the floor up to whoever like to, to start that one off. So I would say maybe traditionally as the traditional viewpoint of it is, I hate to just say a full out no, but let's say it's a very difficult yes. <laughs> so I think because I grew up in the 70s, 80s, right, in Ohio. So the the country has changed in terms of what it is we are kind of focused on. And so then it was all automotive, steel industry was big. So we have to look at the different changes in business sectors over the, over the decades and how they've kind of changed the course of how we're living here in America. And after being in the military, the dream was you come to America, you get a job, you can find a great job, work for a company for 50 years, retire, get a pension, be able to buy a home and send your kids to college all over that course of that time. But that is not the case anymore. And I think it's uh, changed dramatically, especially for uh, the whole country here in America. But I think especially in certain states like California, where it's so out of reach in terms of being able to have that buy that home and own a piece of property or land and because of the changes in the expenses you know and how expensive things have become I think the dream itself has changed dramatically and being married to a Korean you know having his family really immigrate into this country I think it's been it's been quite an eye-opener for many who come here thinking that dream really does still exist and that it's easy, I think, to attain, which it is not. So it's not unattainable, but it's definitely more difficult than ever before to attain that, you know, white picket fence type dream, if you will, um, of owning a home, raising your family, sending them off to college, retiring and traveling around the world. You know, that doesn't happen for the majority. So in a nutshell, that's my take on it. And thanks for this question um, and topic today. You guys really appreciate that. I'm Elizabeth and I yield the mic. This is Kim. I'll speak up second. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Go for it. Go for it. Okay, great. I didn't want to just interrupt. So, okay, so I want to I want to play off what you said. I'm going to take the opposite side of that just for conversation. I definitely see where you're going with that. But so every day I get up and I live my dreams. And every day I meet people who have a dream and I help them achieve that dream. So I stand back and say, if I was saying to my kids, you know, what is the American dream? The American dream is and always has been freedom. And I think that, yes, it, it, it became get a job, you know, go to college, get an education, work for a company. But really, was that ever going to create a path to freedom? No. So the idea that you can own a business, and again, this is what I do every day. So this is my take on the, on the question that you can come to the idea with whatever amount of money that you have and you can turn it into something that you can build a life and you can own your financial future, that you can build a legacy for your kids. And the legacy isn't always the business. It's the dinner conversation about a a business that's the center of a family. It's bringing the kids to the business or giving them jobs in the business. It's the legacy of what an entrepreneurial life looks like more than it is sometimes the specific business because businesses don't last long in this day and age because consumer trends change too fast. The times change too fast. So I say that the American dream is more alive than ever and that COVID showed people the way people were living 
going to work. It, it, people were, were now turned inward. They started focusing again on what really mattered, their family, their health, their home. And people, so many people woke up and said, I'm not going back to that life where I was just a hamster in a wheel or a person on a treadmill doing it for other people. And they're coming out in droves looking at franchising right? Because franchising provides the average person the opportunity to start a business and be successful way more than entrepreneurship does. But so that's my take on the answer. I think the American dream always was and always will be the dream for freedom. And this country allows people to be, have, and do anything that they want if they dare to dream it. And you can find a way. And yes, it might be harder in some ways because things are more expensive, but you could move you can come to New Hampshire <laughs> live free or die <laughs> but no you you know you and I say that like you know in jest and just to, again take the opposite side so people see both sides of the argument but I think the American dream is very very much alive because it's really more about freedom than anything else that is two vets sitting on the stage with us here. So I'm a vet, Olivia is a veteran, Stephen is a veteran. And I think that I won't take up any more time on the floor, Olivia, but I just, you know, I appreciate your comments, Kim. And I just think, I think this is where the disparity is between the veteran community and the civilian community. There's a very skewed view of what freedom really looks like. So I'm not going to speak any more to that, but I appreciate your comments, Kim, because it is great to see it in that perspective. And I think just behind the scenes, it's just a maybe, <laughs> maybe for me, you know, a little more uh, convoluted than that. But thank you, Olivia. I yield the mic. No worries. So, so I definitely hear you, but I would definitely say, so I, I came from California and I had the opportunity to go to the Marine Corps right at high school. And I spent 22 years in the service. I would definitely say that, sure, that, I mean, people that had a financial ability to invest or had a financial ability to do those things, sure, they, they you know, they could do that. There's many that didn't. So when I made the decision to go to the service and go to the core, you know, that was my that was my way to get back and go, you know, to serve my country. And it wasn't about, oh, I went to the to the service to join the core to go get my education. It was, I went to the core to give back to my country, right? I went to the core because it was a lineage of this is going to be what I do to serve. Although the American dream is to be free, freedom isn't free. Like freedom isn't a free thing. It's not a it's not something that doesn't come without sacrifice. And one of the things that is difficult for that is that there are many times that people have told me and, and others that, oh, well, you know, you get free education. Well, no, it, my education isn't free. I paid for it with, you know, missing birthdays. I paid for it with sacrifice, with missing funerals, missing birthdays, missing weddings. I paid for it with, with you know bad knees, bad back, whatever the case may be, right? I'm not, I'm not complaining because I love what I did. And so many people in this country, you know, what, 75% of the people in this country live a very good life for the 25% of the people in the country that have sacrificed for it. So that's, the American dream is a and for them, because of the other 25. Sure, COVID has shown that, yes, there's there's an alternative, and that, that's good. But it's unfortunate that our government, and, and this isn't a political thing, but it's unfortunate that our government doesn't look at the big picture until after they make mistakes. So, for instance, and I'm going to just give an example, and I'm going to yield the mic after this, but... So for an example, this is an example, and I, and I bring this example up because this is a financial, right? It's a financial thing about the American dream. So you have people in North Carolina. I'm physically in North Carolina today. So yesterday, there was a, a conversation about the renaming of Fort Bragg. So there's a lot of people that live at Fort Bragg that are business owners, right? So there's franchisees, there's small business owners, large business owners that are really, at the moment, they're really nervous because now... Uh, their companies are in jeopardy because Fort Bragg is being legally, they're having to change their name, the name on Fort Bragg. It's going to cost $8 million of American tax dollars to change the name. However, these companies are now saying, 
well, my credit union is called Fort Bright Credit Union. Well, what am I going to call it now? Like, what am I going to do? There's this name is not going to be right. So because, you know, civilians make changes and make rules without kind of thinking about the military and the, the veterans and this other population that lives within. And they they think they act where they think kind of like people who act before they speak. They create a windfall of issues and, and challenges for people that they never thought of or they never even considered for people in New Hampshire, for people in Nebraska, for people in these little small towns because they're by a, a military base. And, and that's unfortunate. And so those are the kinds of things that I think of and that people that from the military that, that we think of because of all the places that we've lived in around the country and around the world. The idea of the American dream is still alive? Yes, because we are dreamers. Is the actual dream still, does it exist? Of course it exists. Is it still possible? Yes, it's possible and it's hard. It's unfortunate that it's getting harder because so many barriers are being put in place by people who don't understand because they don't live it, they don't live it hard enough. This is Olivia, I yield the mic. So I have a question. So, and, and the theme that I'm hearing, and this is something that I kind of, I kind of grapple with myself, is the American dream always directly, directly tied to finances? Because a theme that a lot of the answers in this, the dialogue so far is, it's, it's dealing with finances and right, specifically finance and opportunity, like monetarily. Are there other things that kind of add to that part of the dream, whether it's family, whether it's, I don't know, like, are there other components to it or is it, or is it strictly rooted pretty much in finance and opportunity? I think it's more than that. I think it's strictly rooted also in the laws of the land. So I speak and have gotten to know many, many people for, let's say, an example in, in India, where women's rights are still a big deal fighting for it. Many are still advocating for it. So many people don't just come here for the financial freedom or, or, or expectation of being able to have financial independence, I think, but more so also because of the protective laws that we have. So even though we're in the country debating against it ourselves, what we don't seem to realize as civilians I think because they don't have that's why you need to really have that tie with the military the veteran community back to the civilians so that they can really understand on a global scale many people have only their backyard view because that's all they know that's all they've seen that's all they've lived but you know there's a whole big world out here and many women many men are don't have freedom they can't speak they can't live freely they are very under scrutiny or under rule and so a lot of people come here for, to, to be freed of that that's how the the settlers you know came over from uk right to, to to get freedom from that overbearing rule that dictatorship that the the unsafetyness of it all that you know it's very unsafe in many nations you can't just walk around freely like you do here in america and unless you walked um in many of these nations you're not going to know that you won't even have a clue and even people who travel uh, from our country um uh, very blindly, very ignorantly, thinking they're going to go into another country and it's run just like America. Rude, you know, it's a rude awakening. And so I think a, a huge part of that is not just financial, but just the laws and, and being able to have protection for themselves and their families. So that's, that's honestly what I've, I've witnessed and uh, experienced with uh, many who have immigrated here, including my own, uh, you know, in-laws. So that's, that's my take on it. Thanks for the question, Adam, and I yield the mic. Adam, I'm, I'm going to address that uh, in a slightly different way. Really, there are two, if we just oversimplify it, but two facets of the American dream. Income-based, process-based, right? Extrinsic, intrinsic, however we want to differentiate the two. But the extrinsic part of the American dream has a lot to do with... Uh, accumulation of wealth and then that accumulation of wealth in many people's minds help them to believe that, that that's their ticket to freedom to, to living the life that they choose to live on the other side the american dream is 
very much intrinsic in nature that someone wants to live the dream, for example, and wake up in the morning and be excited and fulfilled, purpose-driven in what they're doing. So I think it's very important, you know, to see the definition. I think that there's, of course, there's a balance between the two. We never want to be dream as far as our possessions and an accumulation of wealth because i mean that contributes to so many problems but number one is that people can become very selfish and and greedy in that quest and then the intrinsic part is that we don't want to be too focused on that either because you can't always feel the way that you want to feel there's something to be said you've got to put food on the table for yourself or for your family and fulfill your personal financial responsibility. So Catherine, I like that saying, I yield the mic. That was beautiful. Oh. <laughs> that was so well said. And I just want to come back to what I said and combine it with what she said, because that's actually what I meant. You know, even starting, starting a business, it's not, if freedom is never free, financial freedom always comes at a cost people that are looking for the easy way are the ones who fail right so no matter what you're trying to do get an education raise a family the sacrifice that you make if that's how you look at it is part of the journey to the mountaintop and so when i say the american dream is about freedom it's it's more of what Catherine just said. It's waking up every day knowing that you have the, the choice to do whatever you want, which is not a choice that many other people have in other parts of the world. That's why people come here, as I think Elizabeth said. And so the fact that we can wake up every day and if you don't like your circumstances you can try to figure out how to turn it around and i realize that it's not equal for every person in every part of the country and every culture and every you know race and every economic background but there's still opportunity there's still hope the american dream is the hope that you can make your life different and better and make a difference and you can wake up and have a purpose and that is stripped away in many other parts of the country and i'm a christian and so i'm always going to take that faith-filled you know positive because god is good and our country is immensely blessed by god and until or unless we bring god back fully into the center of who we are as Americans, we may not be as blessed as we were up until this point in our history. But that is, I will drop that mic on that note. But I agree with everything you two women said. It was beautifully stated. And I think we're all sort of saying the same thing. I may take the positive spin on it, but that's my nature. So yeah, I think, but I think in the end, we're all saying the same thing. Like I'm, so I'll say one more thing. I'm 49 years old. I started my first company with no money, just a dream when I was 24. And I tell people when I host live events, I tell people I'm completely unemployable. And my dad would say, yeah, you've been that way since you were two years old. <laughs> I'm this independent. But I say I'm completely unemployable. And I'm so proud of that fact. And, and But it's not because somebody can't afford me. It has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with my independence. It has everything to do with my ability to wake up every day and be 100% in control of the future of my life. And that my freedom has no price, but other people, such as those people on this clubhouse pay the price so I can enjoy that freedom. And that's not to be, that's not to be taken lightly. Right. So I'm not making light of that. So, okay. On that note, I dropped, I dropped the mic. All right. I passed the mic. Thank you for that, Kim. And just a quick side note. So Stephen, Kimberly, if you want to chime in or have any comments or anything else like that, feel free to. I'm not pressuring you to, just inviting you. That's all. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I have, this is Stephen. I had a couple of comments. First of all, I want to thank Olivia and Elizabeth for their service. I've just recently came on Clubhouse and these two fine ladies have been instrumental of, you know, for me to learning a, uh, a lot of things. 
also, Elizabeth, today, earlier in one of the rooms, you mentioned that you were a CASA. And I spent three years as a CASA, and I really, really applaud you for doing that. That is one of the most uh, difficult things to do, but yet one of the most rewarding. I, when I retire, that's one of the things I want to go back into is being a CASA. Now, as far as the, does the American dream still exist? I really believe that it does. My wife and son are Native American and uh, Puerto Rican. But, you know, one of the things as, as a father that I had a difficult thing with was, is making sure that my son knew all of his heritages, and especially with a Native American. And he wanted to be an underwater welder. And so we took him up to the school, you know, for it. And thank God that uh, he talked him out of it. And he ended up just graduating uh, from law school this past May. And he had a lot of rough, being Native American especially, there was a lot of obstacles that were in his way. And, you know, through God and, you know, our guidance, you know, my wife and I, he's become a remarkable young man. And with everything that he's done, he's inspired me to go back to school, you know, for myself. And all of you are, you know, authors, you know, your own businesses and stuff. And that's what I'm looking at trying to do. And that's why I think it's very ben beneficial for me to be on sites like this, listening to Olivia, listening to Elizabeth and, and the other speakers. So to me, the American dream is there. I watched my, you know, my son, rise to become the man that he is he's fulfilling all of his dreams you know that he set out for and i'm looking now and especially with being having ptsd it was very difficult because i just came out of some very dark times but now i see that you know through him and through others that there's you know my whole life is in front of me yet and at 61 you know, I'm still young enough that I can, you know, drink, you know, attain the dreams that I'm looking at, especially, you know, hopefully opening up a, some type of photo business. And I yield the mic and thank you very much. Fantastic conversation. I'm, I was just so pleased to see this. Does the American dream still exist? Thank you, Elizabeth and Olivia. I, Thank you for your service and for everything that you did, because you are absolutely right. We were afforded our freedoms because of you, right? And I don't think that we cannot acknowledge that. And on the other side of that, I do agree with some of what Kim said, whereas we are absolutely so blessed, so blessed. I am so grateful every day that I live in this country and I'm so blessed. And I, I look and I agree. I, I don't remember who it was, but I heard, you know, it's hard. And I absolutely agree on that point too. Things are absolutely not the same. It's not the same. It's not nine to five. You come home, you eat dinner, and and all is well. But really, was that really, you know, at the time, you know, we looked at that and we perceived that as the American dream. I think the American dream, just like everything else in our world, has evolved. But I can't say enough of how blessed I feel to be in this country. But on the flip side of that, how sad I sometimes feel when I see our constitution being rewritten, our laws being changed, statues being taken down, when really, honestly, yes, was everything that happened in history the right, right? No, absolutely not. That's why they call it history. But we are here all living and breathing now, and we can change it. And I agree. That's where the freedom is. As Elizabeth pointed out, as Olivia and I believe Kim and many other people have pointed out, it is such a blessing to be here in this country when in other places, 
those freedoms don't exist. So I absolutely am so grateful for this conversation. We need to have more of these conversations. More people need to be in this room so we can really, really hold space for this beautiful country that we live in and for all of the people, men and women, who have served this country so that we can continue to move forward and can continue to be free. My name is Kimberly, and I am done speaking. Thank you. Hi, Paul. Did you want to jump in? Nice to see you. Please uh, introduce yourself and what your thoughts on the topic. Well, yeah, interesting topic. And, you know, I, I believe the dream still exists. You know, sometimes I've said that I think our best days lie ahead. But also, I believe that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. And right now, I don't see very many people rejoicing. So anyway, I, I just wanted to listen in. And in a few minutes, we have a California recall election page that I'm moderating coming up. So anyway, that's I'll have to leave here in a few minutes. But I'd like to listen in so far. So this is Paul. I'm completing Christ. Awesome. I appreciate you sharing that, Paul. There's one thing that I would like to chime in because I feel like, and I think I agree with, I think most of the points that everyone's made here, you know, my parents came here in the eighties and the American dream to them was about the opportunity because in India where they're from, they did not have, and it was more financially focused and it was more about providing that freedom. Right. And I think from the fifties onwards, or I think even the past couple of hundred years, right? I think the whole point of coming to the U S was about creating those financial opportunities just because in the respective countries, it's a lot more difficult. Like for my, on my dad's side, they have about like 30 cousins and they were all like gunning to take over the family business. It's, it was just too big. And unfortunately my dad's on the younger side. And so he came to the U S realizing like many that have, you know, the millions of people that have come to the U S to, to seek out the American dream, which was building, raising a family, having his kids go to college and then giving them the flexibility, the freedom to basically do whatever they wanted, right. On their own time. I think it's evolved a lot more since then. I don't think, I don't know necessarily if it's strictly just financially driven, because I think part of this whole globalization that's been taking place with the internet. And even the U.S. just being very expensive to live in and prices just continuously going up. I think it's evolved. I think the American dream now, it's just more about opportunity, as you guys all hinted towards, you know, getting away from repressed cultures or, or countries where maybe you don't have the rights that we sometimes I feel take for granted. So anyway, I, I think it, it does exist, but I think the evolution of it becoming more financially focused. I, I think that was a huge factor, right? And I think it still is, right? I think for different parts of the world, but I think a lot of other places in the world have also caught up and they built up their infrastructure as well. So I, I think just the definition of the reasons why people come here, I think that's what's changed more than anything else. But I'm Chirag and I'm done speaking. Chirag, I don't know why you don't start out speaking. You always say everything's so great. And so your examples, your stories, right, Adam? You, you always laugh. You, you need to go first. I feel like he takes I, notes I, and then he's oh, writing yes, a script totally. and then he's like, yeah, <laughs> not perfect. Everybody else gets to be all jumbling and like whatever, whatever. And Chirag's <laughs> back there just meditating. That's why he's my business partner right there. He's got it together. Good job, Chirag, as always. <laughs> Hey, you guys are awesome. <laughs> You're awesome. Oh my god. Oh. So, and not to not to make this into like a political side of things, but I I kind of feel like the American dream, like a big part of it, is that, or just the even just the idea. So the idea and the branding around the American dream, of course, and this is my bias, by the way, as a media guy and as somebody that kind of sees the world with more of a financial lens, just in general, I know I'm not married, no kids, nothing like that. So I don't have those other parts in life yet, maybe one day, but because I don't have those, I do kind of view certain things and with just financial lenses. So I think one of our, like the idea and just the packaging of the American dream in general has been like one of our 
best exports to spread our ideology. You know, in some places, you know, good things, some some maybe some bad things have also spread due to that. But I feel like in the dream overall is definitely um agree with you, Chirag, is evolving. And I think along with that, even like the political systems, like the differences of like, you know, what what is a representative democracy? Like what does that look like? What does capitalism look like? Like all of these concepts with the world becoming smaller. And just with globalization in general, I don't even know if we even use that word anymore. I still use it. I don't know. That's something that I've used for years. I don't know. I don't hear it that often anymore. I guess it's just we're all connected now, right? But as that has happened, that it's becoming smaller. And I think that American dream idea, as it spreads further and further into more places and different places, take it and also make it their own, whether it's culturally, whether it's economically, whether it's political system wise, but it seems like it's kind of morphed into different things for different countries. And obviously how a lot of that distribution was done was through movies and film and magazines and, you know, Hollywood and what, what we send to other countries for many, many years. And um, now I feel like it's evolving and we're getting finally like with the connection on YouTube, things like that. Like I, I would argue, and this could have been the same for everybody else, but for me, it's pretty recent. Like I can say that I've now been maybe consuming some content from abroad and, and seeing some things that I wouldn't have seen in the past. And I guess some that stick out would be like, you know, obviously Bollywood's big. You look at some of the like Korean dramas, the K dramas or some of these other things where you're seeing other cultures. And it's finally, it's kind of like we threw out this boomerang of the American dream. And now we're starting to get, or at least it's finally in my peripheral or vantage point, like I'm starting to get to see the boomerang come back and to just get this exposure to many different cultures through media here now. Before you could travel places, right? And you'd see what things were like, but now it's coming back, I feel like. Um, I mean, any comments on that kind of stuff? That's just been my 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 experience up to this point with it and kind of grappling with what the American dream means. Adam, this is what, yeah, I would have to say, I, I agree with what you're saying in the sense that it's coming back, but it's coming back in a non-discriminatory way or in a non, let me rephrase, in a non-judgmental way. So if you, I, I don't know if you've seen it, I don't know, how, I'm going to be very honest, I don't know how old you are, but I'm more on the seasoned side. <laughs> so when I watched the Bruce Lee story, right, they showed when they were watching, um, when they went to the movies, when Bruce Lee and his wife, had, the girlfriend at the time, walked, or went to the movie theater, they showed the Asian, they, they showed the Asian, an Asian part of this movie, and they were depicting it, and they were, they were making fun of the Asian, the Asian man, right? And so it was, they were making fun. It was very much like, you know, stereotype. Everything was a stereotype, right? Because this was back in the 60s. So everything was very, in, in a very racist format. And he was trying to tell her, you know, this is not who we are. This is not my people. And so the boomerang that has come back is actually showing the people. It's not showing a, like a racist. It's not showing a, like, they're not making fun of, right? So it's not it's not about that. It's actually showing the people and who they really are, right? So they're showing Bollywood for the people they are. They're showing, you know, when you were, we're watching African art, it's actually African art. And we're showing Mexican you know, telenovelas or, or Mexican movies. It's actually Mexican movies. Like, I grew up listening to and watching, you know, Mexican artists. I danced. I grew up dancing Mexican folklorico, right? So I grew up as a actually a Mexican dancer. So for me, when I would watch the jokes and stuff, I mean, I, I watched Mexican comedy, so it was different for me because it's something I used to watch in Mexico as well as in the U.S. But, so, but the boomerang, as you're talking about, especially with social media and with, you know, having this universal thing where it's, we're now interconnected with globalism, it's now we're actually seeing the realities. We're, not, we're seeing the real instead of whatever's portrayed, right? Whatever people are taking and portraying on television for us to see. And that's something Elizabeth had brought up where what I, we, her and I really talk about a lot is that we really enjoy Clubhouse is allowing us to have these interconnections with different people in different countries. And we're, it's not up to the UN to tell me what it is in in Mozambique or Canada or or India or wherever 
it's not up to my country. It's not up to our governments to tell me what those people are like. I can have these conversations with these people directly one-on-one -on, -one on Clubhouse, on WhatsApp. We can literally see each other face-to-face -face and verbally talk to one another, hear each other's inflection, each other's voices. And, and that's a different, those are relationship buildings, right? So we're actually having relationships across the pond that we weren't able to have even 12 months ago. So I think it's right. This boomerang is is really making a difference. And it's 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 globalism at a, it's globalism, but in a more transparent way. It's not to say that people aren't still using it to to do bad, right? So there's always going to be bad act. We're always going to have bad actors. We're going to always have the black cats. We're going to always have the hackers. We're going to always have the, the I forgot her name because she's already got off the stage and she's already left the room, but. As she said, if we can, if, as long as we, as a Christian woman, as a woman who, who believes that if we keep God first and, and God centered in our world and in our lives and we keep him present, this country will continue to and strengthen, you know, the American dream, then we will be able to get back there. But if we don't, we will continue to tumble and fall. This is Olivia and I am complete. Cool. I was actually just going to add, and I actually had an interesting example to share about the, just like the, the culturalism, right? And being able to learn about other cultures. And I think it becoming a little bit more transparent because, because it's just a, there's a lot more money being vested there to, to create that type of content. So I had an interesting call earlier today about a gentleman we were chatting. He is a speaker coach, but on the side, he would do chess training. And I guess there was that um, one huge popular show that came out on Netflix. I forgot the name. I don't know why I forgot the name right now, but it created a huge boom in chess. He said that his business for chess coaching skyrocketed so much that it became the centerpiece of his entire business. And a lot of his clients were actually coming from overseas because of the influence that this show had on the entire culture of making chess look cool. And that's, I think, the prominence with, with, with having, you know, multiculturalism in general is you get to share insights, right? We get to learn a lot about like Korean TV in general, right? Like with BTS coming here and selling out crowds and stadiums here or us becoming more informed about what's happening in, you know, in different parts of whether it's like with through Bollywood in, in India, right? Learning more about that. And I think it's creating this dichotomy where you get to learn about other cultures and it creates reason to even be able to travel there. And I think the second thing here is with, even with COVID, I think a lot of people realize that you could actually create an entire business from home. You don't have to be present to go to an office. I actually had a lot of friends that were moving to Thailand. A, the dollar is the equivalent of like 30 baht, give or take, and a dollar can take you a long way. But for him living in LA, like his cost of living here was like three to 4,000. Now it's somewhere between like five hundred to thousand dollars, and he's getting paid the same amount of money that he was originally getting paid. And I think that's also part of the reason why things have changed and transformed. And I think people's view of the American dream again, it's that's the whole evolution of it. I'm Chirag and I'm done speaking. Those were, and I don't want to be selfish here. So those were those are my questions and my thoughts, kind of like some of the things that I had, you know, I've just been in my mind as we kind of prepared for this. Does anybody else have any like questions or anything else like that or like things they want to chime in? We normally keep this at about an hour or so. So I definitely want to make sure to get everybody involved to get any kind of their last minute, you know, questions, thoughts, just anything else they want to get off their mind on, on this subject. Just want to say thank you for even bringing it up. What a great topic indeed and something to really consistently take a look at. I think, I don't think we've all maybe reevaluated what that dream looks like. I think that the dream is that we still have the ability to dream here. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not unattainable here in this nation. It might be hard. It might be difficult. It might be challenging, but it's still a goal that we could set and choose to try to attain. So I think that in itself, uh, in and of itself, is really the biggest thing for uh, freedom, but I think more so, and I think people would have a, a very, maybe a better idea and a better understanding that, you know, I think people come here, immigrate here, not really realizing why they have this opportunity in the land. It's a very blessed land. We have God here. We, we also have the military that again and again, I can't say it enough that freedom is not free. And so for you to be able to wake up and have choices, somebody else paid a price for that. So I think that what would really help maybe, and I don't know how we might do that. Maybe that could be part of the immigration process 
is to really point that out and make people realize as they're coming here to fulfill their dreams that yeah your dreams is freedom is not free so you know when you come into the nation many people come here with a very uh, self-centered view about what they want for their families and themselves and their future but not really appreciating you know the people who paid the price to make it possible so i think that's one thing especially having lived as a veteran now after having served and now living as a veteran i see a lot of apathy toward the veteran community i see a lot of skewed view points of what the military looks like in America, because every nation's military is very different. Then I can understand that. But I think it's very important that a part of the immigration process should be changed so that people who want to become citizens, want to do business here, want to live here and achieve that dream, realize that it came at a huge price and to be ever grateful for it, because otherwise they could have things the way they were wherever they came from. So for me, that's my closing uh, point on that. It's something I'm always speaking to because I think it's becoming, you know, more and more skewed a little bit. But love having rooms like this, having you two gentlemen, whom I just adore and have grown and really love over these last couple of years, um, is really helping to open that dialogue. So really appreciate you gentlemen. And thank you so very much for having this uh, conversation for today. I yield the mic. This is Olivia, and I actually have a final question before you guys close up here. So Mission Matters Club, you know, I know, I know you guys are, I believe you guys are about to drop another book. Are you looking or are you guys going to be starting another or what are your, will you be guys talking about how you're, you know, going to be going into your next series or will you be doing a room about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we're always publishing more books. We actually just published our business leadership book. Elizabeth was just there. So congrats on your second one, Elizabeth. But we are working on others. So like we have another real estate book coming out. We have a healthcare book coming out later this year or early next year. We also have another business leadership. So yeah, we, we're always working on different topics as well and other segments. And I would love to chat with you, you know, and kind of walk you through and just kind of share insights on how that all works. But we are. The short answer to your question is we are. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other final questions or anything else before we just wrap up here? Cool. Well, with that, thank you everyone for tuning in. Next week's uh, episode or next week's show, again, is going to be taking place next Thursday at 4 p.m. PST, that topic is going to be what lessons have you learned from your favorite book? And so we know that that's going to be a whole nother animal to deal with, because I'm sure there's a lot of folks here that have, well, we have a lot of authors. And I'm sure, you know, being an author, everyone here has probably read a few books themselves and have learned quite a bit. So tune us, tune in next week. Thank you, everyone for joining us. All right. Thank you so much for your time. And see you guys next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.